what is lunacy? What is insanity? In the 19th century, many tried to answer these questions. Some thought lunatics were people who lacked reason, but were conscious of their surroundings. Others believed lunacy occurred when blood wasn't reaching the brain. There were those who even said that when lunatics were violent, it was just nature's way of releasing excess energy. Perhaps the best definition comes from Dr. William Neville, who wrote that insanity was a generic word applied to functional derangement of the brain under extremely diversified and often even opposite behaviors. Regardless of the definition used, we know that the insane were sent to asylums. In France, a law was introduced in 1838 which allowed for the committal of the insane by their family or by prefects. In New York, in 1866, laws were passed that required that an insane person be sent by their family members to a state lunatic asylum. Asylums were supposed to treat and cure the insane through medical and moral treatments. But what happened behind closed doors? Look at the women committed to these asylums and you find a different picture. The asylums contain women who had dared to question and disagree with their husbands over Christian ideology. Women whose families thought they had expressed too much grief, or too little. They had all challenged social norms through their actions or mere presence. Not only that, but the asylums frequently abused their patients, beating and whipping them. Investigations found patients living in squalor, naked and chained in their rooms. What were these asylums meant for, then? Were asylums supposed to be treating the insane? Or silencing those who challenge the status quo? Hi, Uda. Again, I want to apologize for how long it's taken for me to upload any new material. It's for exactly the same reasons as before. It's got so much going on in my life. Anyway, enough of that. So what you just seen was a clip of what used to go on in some of the lunatic asylums or institutions have come under so many different names over the years. And it's not something that is supposedly new through history. I mean, obviously the timeline is questionable and I question a lot of a lot of the stuff before the 1800s, like Christmas. And when you have no records, scarce records, and you're relying on other people's stories. I think it's a very slippery slope. So because of the lack of documentation before the 1800s, you do have to take everything with a pinch of salt. I want to talk today about some of the reasons that they were putting people into these asylum, asylums or institutions. Uh, but not only that, I want to sort of try and point out, without alarming people too much, um, of the striking parallels of today. And it does seem to be a way where they seem to silence people and possibly keep stuff out of the mainstream. Therefore, when people are looking back through records and history it does make it difficult for people to find out the truth but yeah i'll be looking through largely uh because this is my area um in dorset um a, a particular asylum um it does actually tie in quite well with some of the architecture as well and and a little side bit where it's claims that this complex is built in a ridiculously quick amount of time. But essentially, yeah, this, this video is about the um, mental institutions. Yeah, was it possibly used in an attempt to change the mindsets of nations? Because it would be, and the evidence does suggest, a way to suppress and could they, by force, could past known histories and culture have, have, have been wiped out? Anyone who, who questions the status quo would just 
labeled as lunatic. These institutions have a history, and most of these old asylums are these Tartarian, old world looking buildings that have been taken over and repurposed. You find very similar themes with the same common story, and they all use similar terminology, such as being founded or established in 1804 or 1820, but what if these were not created during the 1800s, but were actually taken over after some type of reset? Many of the dates that they give us can be easily manipulated as well, but for the most part. The oldest asylum is in Virginia, and it was founded in 1773. So most of these all started popping up around the 1812 to 1850 Civil War time period, and they actually use that as an excuse for why they needed to create even more of these institutions because people were insane after the war and they needed these institutions as places of refuge. History attempts to paint these asylums in a positive light, but what if it's the complete opposite? That was a clip from Mind Unveiled. You should be able to see it in the top left hand corner. Highly recommend his channel and work. So, Dorset County Asylum started its life at Forston House. Um, it was a private dwelling that was supposedly donated by Francis John Brown. Another interesting story to this as well, which has been a deep, deep rabbit hole that I've gone down. Is, oh, I've been doing this research for nearly a month now. But this Francis John Brown was, was the last in line in his family. So his tradition used to be that he used to hand down your assets to your first son. And of course, if you didn't have any um, children, which I don't believe Francis Brown did, I'm imagining it was decided by the court who got the assets. Um, it's very interesting that Francis John Brown is the last in line in his family and his, his property that gets donated for a lunatic asylum. Anyway, I diverge. So yeah, it started off its life as at Forsen House, which was a relatively large property. But very quickly, um, and you can see in some of the reports through the years, that it became overcrowded and they needed another, they needed another location. A new location was sited at a place in Harrison. So the asylum was designed by Henry Edward Kendall Jr. and it was in an 1859 competition. Uh, this seems to be a common theme with quite a lot of asylums across the country. So they bought the site in 1860 and the asylum opened in 1863 so are you telling me that they built this place in three years i can pretty much safely say or we can pretty much safely say that that isn't the case so who have they bought it from that is not clear i've looked <laughs> i really have looked so again yeah it, it fits into what other Others have said with these place being that it's very careful wording, like established or founded, were these places just taken over after some sort of reset? Um, was it tied in with the enclosure acts that were, were kind of going on where land was just being, well, swamps of land were just being taken over by the rich and what used to be sort of common land was just being taken over as people's backyards, basically. This is a report from 1864, for the year 1863, from a Dorset asylum in Dorchester, Charminster. Um, I believe it's now called Harrison House. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show you a few things from this report. 
that are quite interesting. Here we've got a document from uh, Dorset Asylum. I'll skip to the bit I want to read to you. So, the only death to which we have specially to advert was that of Sarah Polden, a pauper patient from Wimborne Minster who was brought from her home in a state of extreme prostration after attack of acute mania and died of exhaustion within five days of her admission. So what they'll say is, well, it wasn't understood back then and um, we were only at the beginning of understanding mental health and all this blah, 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 blah. So basically the definition of mania, I'd never heard of it before, to be honest, but it is a thing and um, there's been articles and bits and pieces written on it. So mania can be mania can be defined as extremely elevated mood, both physical and emotional. Therefore, we can say that acute mania is sudden and severe onset of an elated mood. The mood can be irritable, aggressive, or psychotic. Basically, a form of bipolar. So if you go back to the document, they're trying to make out that these people were dying of bipolar. Basically. This is a report from Forster, I believe, 1860, page 8, I believe. So one case was received from the Union of Weymouth, which ought to be noticed. The man had been a convict in Dartmoor Prison for some length of time and was just discharged on ticket of leave and sent his parents sent to his parents at Weymouth. His first act was to use was the use of violent language toward them towards them, swearing they were no relations of his and uttering threats of very unpleasant nature. He was immediately conveyed to the union and from thence there and from thence here he was reported to me as having been insane for several months. And this being so, he must have been discharged from the prison in an insane state. <laughs> if we look at a register here for 1866, and we've got some of the causes of insanity. So if we go down the list, assigned case of insanity, you've got religious excitement, Loss of wages, excessive drinking. And if you look down the form of mental disorder, you'll see the majority of them are mania. Again, this is from the same year, and this is um, not a discharge form, but where they have written down some of the deaths and the causes in that particular year. So don't get me wrong, like I've mentioned, I'm sure there were some people in these places that generally needed help. But as we know today, I mean, you can, you don't need to send people to madhouses to deal with epilepsy. And yeah, they shouldn't be dying. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the fourth line down, he's 29 years old. And he's died of epilepsy and exhaustion. Obviously, knowing what we know now, are these causes of death genuine? You've got to say you've got exhaustion from mania, epilepsy. I'll read you out this article because it's really good for understanding the timeline of things that went on. Yeah, the word bedlam comes from. The Priory of St Mary at Bethlehem, which was founded in London during the 13th century. By 1377, it had become home to people suffering from mental illness, whereas the inhabitants were described at the time as destructive persons. The law, meanwhile, was concerned that land landowners were of sound mind, and indeed the law continued to be concerned about the property throughout the centuries. By 1735, Hogarth was using Bedlam to end his social morale fable of the rake's progress and the conditions in which patients found themselves were horrendous. I would have to be said that the terminology by which mental health was described throughout history gives very little thought to the patients or their families. By the end of the 19th century, 
more than 70,000 patients have passed through the doors of an insane asylum of some kind or other. Nationally, there were 120 asylums. The 1800 Criminal Lunatic Act was particularly interested in securing those people who wanted to assassinate the monarch and the criminally insane. The 1808 County Asylum Act dealt with fundraising methods that combined taxation with public subscription. The idea was that the poor insane should be removed from workhouses and prisons. The wealthy insane were being paid for by their families and resided in private sanitariums or locked up in various secluded attic rooms. Almost inevitably, lunacy became a condition in many countries as a method of differentiating between the deserving and undeserving poor. (laughs) I ruined that. So, basically, yeah, lunacy suddenly became a condition in all these countries. I won't say that other word, but there was also the fact that men and women who behaved in an socially unacceptable way could be deemed to be mad and shut away, often for the rest of their lives. Records reveal that many people spent their lives locked up in asylums, having been sent there for reasons other than madness including in one instance for excessive shopping in her husband's opinion. I'll show you some of the reasons this is quite amusing. Being for the people back then. In 1828, an act required all pauper lunatics to be documented and certificated. This in turn would mean that commissioners would be able to inspect institutions and people incorrectly placed in asylums would be released. Theory and care could be monitored, gradually more humane treatment became the norm, although restraint remained common practice for a long time, as did incarcerating people not for mental health problems, but for their socially unacceptable behaviour or for having the misfortune to be born with learning difficulties. So I'm just going to squeeze this in the middle quickly, as it's kind of the main reason that I'm kind of doing this video and, and why it's kind of connected to the old world history. So, what a lot of us suspect is that the Napoleonic Wars have a big connection with some sort of reset, and it's no secret in mainstream that there was a war then. It was obviously originally called the Great War, I believe. So people back then. Now, imagine for a minute that what we suspect is quite possibly true, that they basically destroyed, pretty much conquered the world. Um, Lots of places were taken over, probably left abandoned, they probably had lots of mansions and that left over, lots of lands, didn't know what to do with it, and you're going to have lots of people that know what's happened. What are you going to do with these people? You're going to put them in mental institute, or you're going to, you're going to have to try and orchestrate a way to get rid of these people. And how would you do that? And what a lot of us suspect is it was done through these mental institutions and and that is why they they were popping up all over the world. We'll get taken into consideration the lack of documentation before the 1800s. Was it destroyed? And like what's going on at the moment, it's not just going to be an overnight process, it's going to be a slow process, Um, like what's going on at the moment, um, we understand it a little bit better with how they're sort of trying to start the reset at the moment. People like us, back then, would have been suppressed, the info that they were producing would have been suppressed, just like the info that we share at the moment is suppressed and taken down, deleted. Back then it would just 
that have been destroyed, the book burnings, all that sort of stuff. In 1845, county asylums became a legal obligation and the Loon Lunacy Commissioners were appointed to oversee the running of asylums. It was only in 1890, with the passage of another act, that county asylums began to move away from their pauper associations to begin their evolution to hospitals caring for all walks of life. So yeah, in 1845, it became a legal obligation for every county to have an asylum. Interesting. Interestingly, Wakefield was one of the first asylums to employ therapeutic employment, though this was thanks to the enlightened attitude of Dr. William Ellis, who moved from, Wake, who moved from Wakefield to Hanwell in 1832. Ellis was a believer in the benefits of outdoor work rather than the brutality exposed by earlier mad doctors. It is perhaps for this reason that many of the Victorian asylums were set in beautiful grounds. In practice, it would appear that one doctor and a vicar would be enough to certify a poor person in some locations. And going back to looking at comparisons with today, I just wanted to highlight a few things and a couple of my worries. And, and I don't want it to sort of come across as fear-mongering or alarmism. And I'm kind of glad I'm doing this video now when the... C bill in Parliament has now elapsed because there are certain things in that bill that back up would suggest they were maybe they even did do it for a few people. You, you don't know. You wouldn't hear about these things. Yeah, they may have detained people under that mm -mm legislation bill. I think you know what I'm talking about. So what have they been promoting the last few years? Like, and we know full well that they do not care about our health or about our well-being. So the last three, four, five years, they have been hammering the hell out of mental health and saying to be aware of this and aware of that. And it's... Very similar with the parallels of of what uh, of how they were how they sold locking people up in institutions to the masses before. Um, again, bear in mind that none of this stuff is going to be done overnight. They can't just create these ideas, create these agendas, and then expect the public just to come on board overnight. They have to build it up, sow seeds, propaganda, all that stuff. The reason I've always been a little bit worried about this, and it's always been in the back of my mind, is because if you, we know what this agenda is at the moment. Now the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now if we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. But there we see an increase of uh, about 1.3. But we know this is a depopulation agenda, right? And the thing that's always been in the back of my mind is, whilst they're doing all this stuff, um, and the Vs are taking out certain people, the only people that are being taken out at the moment are what I would class as without being too disrespectful to those people. They're taken out. It's, it's the brainwash, isn't it? So our numbers, our percentage compared to the asleep, compared to the masses, is turning in our favour. And it will always turn in our favour because it's only the heavily conditioned masses that will go along with these things and be victims. So I've always thought in the back of my mind, what do they have planned for us? There must be something 
they must have a plan to deal with this percentage swaying into our favor because whilst they're doing this is always making our percentage better and bigger and like i've mentioned they can't do they don't do these things overnight and if you know of a little thing called agenda 2021 20, yeah agenda 21 it was before agenda 30 now is this the plan they they have for us again as they say, history repeats itself. I don't really like those catchphrase, cliche sayings, but there is no the truth to it. They, it goes around in cycles. They use all the same tricks again, over and over again, with slight alterations, obviously. But yeah, that's always been my worry. And I say, I it just notice in the parallels with what they were doing before. Um, are they building up to this again? And I'm just going to leave you with another clip from Mind Unveiled, which is really interesting. I will put the video in its entirety. It's from the same video that I showed a clip of earlier, but I'll put a link for that in the description. But are they the fascinations and delusions of a schizophrenic or could these things possibly have existed? What do you think? There was this guy named James Tilly Matthews. He was a London tea broker who is basically the first documented case of schizophrenia. In the 1790s, concerned at the likelihood of a war between Britain and France, Matthews, who traveled to France, was a part of some type of resistance or the Gerundist, which were attempting to end the monarchy. Whether he was working as a spy for the English is questionable, but after spending time in France, he was accused of being associated with these Gerundists, which the French establishment at the time used the whole reign on terror as an excuse to imprison their enemies and to continue their agenda of control. So Matthews was thrown in prison and after three years, the French authorities concluded that he was a lunatic and released him. When he returned to London, Matthews wrote two letters to Lord Liverpool complaining about conspiracies directed to him and during some debate in the House of Commons, he yelled treason. Now, I don't know if that's completely true, who knows, but basically the officials arrested him and placed him in the Bethlehem Hospital in 1797. After examination, he declared that he had taken part in secret affairs of state in reference to his efforts in France. After 10 years in the hospital, his friends and family petitioned for his release on the grounds that he wasn't insane. His family hired their own doctors, Matthews was re-examined, and he was declared sane. So this is when it gets really crazy. A year after he was released, a man named John Haslam produced the book Illustrations of Madness, in which he intended to settle the dispute over Matthews' sanity. Essentially, this book is what ends the debate on what really happened with Matthews. It shares his story and paints him as a lunatic, even though the author does attempt to stay unbiased. But here's the thing. Even though there are some elements to the story that may be caused by some type of schizophrenia, it's likely that this was purposely induced as he knew way too much information. What do you think they did to him for 10 years in the hospital? So essentially, this was made to make this information look like complete insanity, when really, there may be some truth to it. Let's remember that during this time, asylums were mainly vehicles of the state. So Matthews believed that there was this gang of criminals and spies skilled in pneumatic chemistry. This gang would torment him by means of rays emitted by a machine called the heirloom or gaseous charge generator. They put James Matthews in Bethlehem Hospital because he knew of the secret war machine that was used by these French revolutionaries, which we can ask who were these revolutionaries and is there something else going on with that story? But essentially, 250 years before the CIA's failed brainwashing experiments, somehow French revolutionaries in France had created a mind control machine in Death Ray. Is this another setup revolution similar to the Bolshevik revolution that was a counter operation? James somehow found himself mixed in the middle and only due to his family, he luckily got out and left us with the only known knowledge of these devices. Who knows, these could be even older and explain how many other cities were taken over behind the scenes. But in his very descriptive explanation of the machine, Matthews explained that these machines had been deployed all over London, secretly, in cellars. 
the heirloom was enormous. It stood seven meters tall, and it was surrounded by barrels that fed noxious gases through oiled leathered pipes into the main body of the machine. The gases were derived from substances including gas from the horse's anus, seminal fluid, and putrid human breath. The heirloom used magnetically charged air particles that could be directed towards its victim in order to induce the effect of mesmerism. Of course, we don't take mesmerism seriously today in modern science. However, this was not the case during this time period, and obviously there was an advanced machine capable of inducing these effects, so who's to say that these people can't do the same with their minds, but regardless, the machine needed to be operated by a certain amount of members who each had their own name and duty, as described by Matthews. The main body of the machine had a number of keys, levers, and brass retorts. These were used to modulate the flow of magnetically charged air that was emitted from the machine. Skillfully combined sequences of the various levers and keys could produce different types of air current, which could be directed towards the victim to assault them with a whole arsenal of psychological and physiological effects. Essentially, this was some type of instrument, and an art at that, as someone would basically play it as a piano and magnetically charge the air current with the intention of directing it towards the victim to assault them. One of these effects were called kiting, where an idea is forced into the thoughts of the victim, which undulates in the intellect for hours together, and how much soever the person assailed may wish to direct his mind to other subjects, he finds himself unable to do so. Similarly, thought making. This game could literally suck the thoughts out of a victim out of their head and replace it with any subject they choose. They had an effect called lobster cracking, in which the external pressure of the magnetic atmosphere surrounding the person assailed was increased so as to stagnate his circulation and produce instant death. They also interestingly talk about nutmeg, which is also known to give a psychedelic reaction to those who are allergic. They must have known that it could be used as a suggestogen. There are even depictions of the number of controls this machine had, multiple parameters for a variety of different settings. Now think about it, if this was just a delusion, then how is it possible to have such a detailed description of this device? There is another part of this that we will cover briefly. Basically when you look up influencing machine, what you have is all these educated mainstream scholars concluding that the heirloom and other mind control devices are just visions of schizophrenics. But not just that, but there's even something more profound to get from all this, that the influencing machine is some deep subconscious archetypal trope. Now, I'm not saying that this can't happen to someone with schizophrenia, but I am very suspicious of this public opinion in that these are all simply hallucinations of madmen. First off, isn't it convenient that the first schizophrenia patient ever just so happens to have the most detailed engravings of this machine and no one at this time had been discussing any technologies like this in public literature so there was no way he just imagined this out of nowhere. They literally built a working replica of the machine. It wasn't just a delusion, this was influenced by some type of event and this wasn't just with James Matthews. There have been several counts of artists depicting these types of devices but they're just labeled as insane. Or they just try to decode this as some deep Jungian philosophical symbolism when, really, there may be multiple things going on. Spiritual forces that influence these peoples, and or physical devices that actually do exist and influence the thoughts of their victims. There are actually quite a few depictions of these, and of course, it's not to say that every one of these is real, but this idea of a mind control device is obviously prevalent in our psyches and Sure, you can take the psychiatrist approach and just say it's an aspect of our deep subconscious or whatever, and I'm sure that does play a part, but it's not the meat of the subject. All the scholarly work on the subject tends to take this viewpoint. However, as many of you are thinking, these types of devices have existed for who knows how long, 